Buongiorno a tutti. Good morning. Today it's the last day of our uh, event and of the waste management uh, uh, exhibition. I see some new faces. Um, do I have to keep the mic closer? Can you hear me? So, you know, having to recap in two words what is perform water. Well, I think you're all familiar with it. It's an experimental study that has been carried out for some years uh, during the COVID period, financed by the Lombardy region. Cap Holding was the uh, the hat company um, that put available some depuration plans, and then some companies participated, among which CIAD for. Uh, um, studying depuration processes and we are going to uh, tackle four or five main uh, topics that uh, we are uh, tackling with some pilot plans in uh, on, on site and then also on the, in the lab for the uh, analytics and then in the office to understand better the data and analyze the data, building all the, the relationships and uh, filling up all the reporting um, and uh, for preparing the presentations we are about uh, to present to you. Yesterday um, we heard uh, papers uh, also uh, we had the professors of the polytechnics uh, present and our lab. Uh, today we're going to continue on this discussion and we will start with the engineer Bossolotti who is a scientific uh, sort of uh, uh, um, a reference point. Uh, his, uh, uh, um, the, the, the holistic person we could say. So he's really looking at 360 degree on, uh, view. So he takes into account a much larger view. So I'll give immediately the floor to him. Engineer Kadara also yeah, suggests me another key term, which is complexity, yes. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for the introduction. This uh, complexity word, and uh, you know this uh, holistic view. You know that uh, uh, these key concepts are really uh, dear to me. Actually, we're, today we're going to continue on um, the discussion that we started uh, 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 yesterday. So I'll try and draw some conclusions. Uh, yesterday we saw a few slides, um, and we mentioned about a SIAD uh, uh, spirit. So actually, our sort of focus is that of research work. Uh, we have uh, spoken at length about the perform water and uh, the, the environmental impact. Uh, and then also we mentioned uh, this, uh, the big effort uh, that was uh, made on the part of our lab uh, to tackle the topics in, in a holistic way at 360 degree uh, uh, in terms of the slant treatment. So yesterday we saw many, I mean, hands on uh, outcomes that we have received uh, out of this um, study. So uh, then you might ask, why shouldn't we just focus on these outcomes, uh, uh, especially those that had the highest impact? Let's focus on that and let's not consider other options. Uh, why not? Well, because of this holistic approach that we like, we don't know what the future will be. And uh, of course, uh, our, our uh, you know, sales colleagues will uh, uh, start to sort of promoting those that had the best impact. But we should not neglect the others. And uh, I would like to stress again this uh, 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 um, uh, key word, uh, 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 gas, uh, uh, gas that are in the life of the biological plants. So we don't know where we will end up 
prefer continuing on studying about these gases. So there are no reasons why not continuing on and studying further this so holistic, this um, holistic view. And then another keyword is environmental impact. Now, the environmental impact uh, uh, is not a concept that started uh, um, uh, as, uh, as a tea. It comes from the complexity philosophy that uh, came before, so everything is connected, and hence the environmental impact. If you remember the sources, uh, then you understand uh, where we are going. Uh, and it's not so much the loss, but it's the trajectories. Uh, so before uh, uh, getting to a law, a regulation, uh, you need to share the concepts. Whereas sometimes uh, there are those uh, sort of uh, trajectories that we identify. And that connection is also very important. Now, besides complexity, everything is connected. Um, and then we have um, the uh, rip ripples and waves. Because you know that we have anomal anomalous waves, strange waves. Well, they are just a sum of ripples. We don't know their frequency, but when uh, this sort of strange arrangement of ripples uh, happens, then these unusual waves uh, are produced. So. Uh, it, 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 some of these ripples become very large waves, and sometimes it's all of a sudden. I remember I was at the seaside, and there was someone there reading the newspaper, um, and all of a sudden, a big wave came, and uh, uh, this person was covered up with water. You know, we had a calm sea, and all of a sudden, a big wave. But actually, if you look at this with the uh, uh, sort of industrial eyes, you could study that sort of uh, phenomenon and understanding which ripples are going to bring about that big wave. So, and then another keyword is serendipity. Serendipity is not, uh, you know, being lucky. Uh, serendipity is knowing and being able to see. Now, the examples in the life of. Uh, uh, of man are many, and it would be a long story. But to make it short, well, we are all looking around, but sometimes we're not sort of uh, 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 focusing on what we, we should uh, actually focus on. And uh, I'll, I'll be quick, don't, don't worry. But, you know, like, Gravity, think about gravity. Only the, the ancient Greeks understood what it was. They thought that actually Earth is a, 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 a round planet and is a sphere. And so that it's, it, and this is a knowledge that we've never lost in the years. But there have been years uh, when there was this movement of the flat Earth uh, and the sun that would stop and so on and so forth. And then Newton was born. Uh, but do you really believe that Newton start, uh, uh, thought about uh, his law because of this apple falling on his head? Well, maybe, yeah, it's a nice storytelling, but, you know, I think that he himself had the knowledge to sort of um, derive the formula. And this serendipity is not being lucky, but it's being able to see. But in order to be able to see the right things, you need to be knowledgeable. You need to have a lot of knowledge on your shoulders, so to speak. And which one, we don't know. In our world, the world of waters, maybe we will discover that hydrogen will be the key for solving the banking problem in the sludges, or maybe uh, uh, an unbalance and something. So we need to be able to see. We need to be sort of knowledgeable enough to be able to detect what we should and uh, see what we should see.
Thank you, thank you very much to Engineer Bissellotti, who just uh, said uh, sort of a, a few words, but very important ones. Eleonora, what do you want to tell me? Uh, okay. Oh, we now have actually Mrs. Pazinetti. So now we will have um, Eleonora Pazinetti. Thank you very much, uh, Riccardo. Well, yesterday mm, we provided you with the uh, the outcomes uh, uh, for the per for water um, research work. Today we don't have much time, so I'll be shorter than yesterday, but uh, I would like to give you anyhow an overview of all the activities we've carried out on the hall. Today we're going to focus on just two topics, and yesterday we focused on another two topics. For those of you that were not present yesterday, uh, uh, um, could, uh, could not hear about the outcomes, and so here for you, sort of a summary of what we said yesterday, and the Perform a Water project. Okay, thank you very much. So here you see. Uh, some uh, um, key uh, pieces of information about the Port Form Water 2030 a platform of research and demonstration for technologies to face the challenges of the public water management sector. So, a project that is really challenging, and SEAT wanted to be part of it, wanted to participate with different targets. Uh, the uh, um, Environmental Biology and Chemistry Lab participated in the project and wanted to seize this opportunity because, you know, our our focus is to study uh, 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 and carry out uh, feasibility studies uh, in terms of water uh, um, depuration. And so we wanted to make a step further thanks to this project uh, and uh, trying and see uh, all of these phenomena that we've been studying in the lab uh, uh, um, uh, on the field. So that was a really important opportunity for us because, you know, uh, working on site uh, in terms of cubic meters uh, on the field with continuous cycle plans and not batch plans, well, that was for us very important. As Ricardo said, uh, we've ha we had a sort of a, a, a team um, with uh, nine partners in total, uh, and the head was the CAP. Uh, and plus the three university research centers, Irsa, Brugerio, and then the two universities of the Polytechnics in Milan, that was a scientific sort of reference partner, and the Bicocca University uh, in Milan. Uh, the project was funded by the Lombardy region, a European fund, for a total of 9 million euros. Uh, and here you see a recap of our targets and the activities that were carried out in these four years. Uh, we mentioned the fact that the target was to optimize processes in terms of uh, 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 integrated processes for uh, water treatment. Uh, you see the four main pillars um, in our activity. So water, sludge, air, and biogas. So we've actually had five research lines, uh, 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 but yes, so the project was quite a complex one. As for water, we assessed the possibility of applying the ozonization process for removing micro pollutants. Uh, 
uh, with the ozone and uh, uh, advanced chemical processes, so uh, oxygen uh, uh, with oxygenated water and a pure oxygen optimization of activated sludge process. As for the sludge uh, uh, area, we tested the possibility of using ozone leases on the water line, so on the secondary sludge uh, for an, and also uh, an anaerobic digestion. It's quite a wide and challenging uh, area. It was the first time that we focused on this uh, uh, topic, i.e. the possibility of assessing the impact of depuration processes on air, on the air quality around the plant. So we assessed the aerosol, so greenhouse gases, VOCPM, and bioaerosol. And to do so, we had to uh, look at the biological uh, treatment process for the activated uh, sludge. So we're talking about pure oxygen. And we had an air line in the plant that hosted us, but we assessed both lines and both processes. So this activity uh, was very sort of uh, uh, energy consuming for us and resource consuming. It took us quite a lot to assess these two biological processes in the ears so that uh, we could uh, really check the aerosols. That was really challenging for us. And then the last uh, uh, focus was that on uh, the possibility of increasing the quality of biogas and the production of biogas. We tackled this through the application of zonal leases of sludge and anaerobic digestion, and also the possibility of optimizing the biogas quality with pure oxygen to reduce H2S concentration. And where have we carried out this activity? On the right-hand side, in light blue, you see these sites where innovative technologies of the CAT group were made available. We worked in the San Giuliano Milanese West, Western plant. And the total period was four years, so 30 plus six months plus six months is what you see. So at the beginning, uh, uh, the, the time frame was 30 months, and then we added uh, further six months uh, because many partners actually felt this need to prolong the research activities and uh, to continue on. Uh, this research because actually the situation was more complex than we thought. And then the remaining six months uh, were uh, due to mainly to COVID that uh, had halted our activities, so we had to catch up. In this slide, um, in, at the, in the center, you see an aerial view of the plant, but all the arrows uh, and all the, the pictures around show you all the activities that we carried out. As you see, uh, we have uh, taken into account all the different treatment steps uh, in the plant. So. Oh, we would like to thank the CAP group for having uh, given us the opportunity to use this well-equipped lab that allowed us to work on site. That was the big value added, especially in the sampling days, because the majority of the analytics was then done directly in the lab. Uh, just a couple of words uh, quickly on the uh, treatment uh, plant of San Giuliano Alvest, um, a biological activated sludge reactor, uh, and uh, uh, 30,000 PE, um, 450 cubic meter per hour. 
uh, primary settling on the water treatment line, biological activated this lead reacted, and acid and arabic type, secondary settling, filtration, and UV disinfection. As for this large line, we have a pre thickener, anaerobic digestion, post thickener, and dewatering. In the central part, uh, you see that we have added on the water treatment line what I said before, i.e., thanks to the CAP group that uh, uh, made for us available a uh, 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 a uh, 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 tank, then we revamped it for uh, a pure oxygen activated uh, sort of uh, pilot print. It was a pilot print, as I said. Uh, as it would, the output would become again the input, but uh, it was an important opportunity for us uh, to work uh, on, a, on a real plant. Of course, uh, the flow rate was uh, lower, and uh, you see 60, 70 cubic meter per hour. And uh, the VOX uh, uh, out of the 1,200 uh, cubic meter, we used 450 cubic meters. Uh, well, we said that among our targets, um, we wanted to uh, assess a zonal leases on the sludge line and water line, secondary biological process, and also with the, on the anaerobic digestion process. Uh, there's no time for me to just to summarize all the outcomes and results um, because we did that yesterday. As for the anaerobic digestion, the possibility of implementing biogas production, improving its quality with the aim of minimizing production. That is the presentation of yesterday, but we can say that all of the outcomes and results will be published in the next issue of Ingenieria Ambiente that will be available by uh, next month. So I invite you to read uh, fully uh, all of the results um, on the issue. Um, has a for uh, sludge minimization on the secondary biological process, which is the topic of today. I'll uh, move on. And uh, in terms of using also uh, the oxidation treatment uh, and the tertiary for the tertiary treatment, well, this uh, topic was dealt with yesterday. In a nutshell, we can say that this activity allowed us to understand whether it is feasible or not to remove the majority of micro pollutants, and by that we mean of, uh, of frequencies and uh, drug active principles. So we checked the possibility of removing uh, uh, almost 100% of such compounds with the um, uh, outcomes over 95%. And for this, uh, we assessed the combined process with oxygenated water, so an advanced uh, chemical process. Uh, has for the topic I was uh, mentioning before, i.e. the impact of a treatment plan uh, for uh, the air quality and this is one of the topics we're going to deal with today. And so um, the next presentation will go in details about it. And this is the last slide summarizing the results. And here you see also some figures. In this slide, uh, uh, we see besides results and figures that are also important, but what is important here is to highlight the complexity of the path that, however, allowed us to obtain very interesting outcomes as engineer 
is a lot to add. But as it happens with any research work, this is also the basis for further investigations because actually many question marks also were raised out of this research work. So we cannot stop here uh, and we will continue on with our research work. So we don't stop here. But all in all, we can say that uh, as for the results obtained, well, we can say that we can provide useful answers to start an optimization process in terms of the treatment processes. So in a, again, to summarize, you see on the left hand side the team of our lab that carried out the work. Uh, I want to name them all, uh, the names of the colleagues uh, that really did a great job throughout these four years. Uh, Michela Peroni, uh, she'll be one of our speakers, and then uh, Mrs. Giorgia Giannini, Davide Preda, Andrea Crema and engineer Matteo Cascio, uh, who's actually not working with us anymore. And then the new entries in the team, Sara Mattiuzzi and uh, Davide Solverino. And then Alessandro Brina, he left us last year. Oh, oh, we wanted to sort of uh, uh, also, I mean, say, goodbye to him uh, because he worked uh, 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 with great efforts on this uh, project. Thank you very much, uh, Eleonora, for sticking with the time. I would like to greet uh, uh, Professor Scanziani, dear friend of mine. He'll be uh, a speaker of our session. Uh, uh, we haven't seen each other for so long. Also, Engineer Matteo Salvaso, Uniacque, and all the Uniacque representatives, uh, they have been an historical partner of ours, uh, and uh, we've been collaborating in terms of generations. So, and uh, yes, Mr. Galdan is actually one of the senior ones, but uh, yeah, Uniacque really believed in all these uh, projects. Uh, and uh, yeah, I must say that we've been collaborating for 30, 40 years with um, uh, the majority of, of uh, treatment processes are, you know, with pure uh, hosting. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, yeah, I invite you to come to the floor and tell us all about. Well then, good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Matteo Salmaso and I am in charge of the purification system of Uni Acque, the integrated system on the province of Bergamo. Thank you for this invitation because I will have the uh, chance of uh, uh, presenting the way in which Uni Acque uh, tackled a circular economy uh, for sludge. My presentation will uh, focus uh, on three main uh, pillars. It will not be as a technical uh, presentation as the SEAD one, but it will just give you an overview of how we managed uh, the uh, uh, system. And uh, so it's uh, uh, going to also tackle the presentation of the company I work for. And uh, I will introduce the master plan that we have adopted for sludge management. And finally, three focus uh, points uh, on uh, the innovative technologies that we have uh, applied, uh, two of which uh, that uh, we will uh, use uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, developed them uh, uh, together with SIAD. 
So very, very rapidly, the integrated uh, water service, you very well know what the water cycle is, uh, and uh, our activity is really permeated with the concept of circular economy. So we uh, catch water, and then uh, we supply it back to the environment uh, clean, uh, thanks uh, to a monitoring uh, uh, network. Uh, and we want to uh, avoid, uh, of course, uh, waste, uh, and we want to be as effective and efficient as possible. In all of the three services, so aqueduct, uh, fun, uh, um, sewage, and purification. These are the key figures of uh, Uniaque. We have uh, one million inhabitants that uh, we supply water to in the Bergamo area and the province, except for small uh, mountain uh, municipalities of the Valle Brembana and uh, uh, Caravaggio Nisola. And at the moment, there is another company uh, that works uh, for these uh, municipalities. Our municipalities are 213, and we have 151 million uh, cubic meters of water in the network. Uh, this is the uh, data coming from our uh, sustainability uh, report uh, that we are drafting for the have been drafting for the last uh, three years. We've received uh, an in-house uh, um, contract for the next 30 years. Uh, the treatment plants uh, that we manage are uh, purification plants, uh, so uh, an equivalent uh, of uh, 500 uh, uh, inhabitants in the mountainous areas up to the consortium of uh, the plains uh, or the Valseriana that uh, has 250,000 inhabitants. Uh, well, it's not like uh, the figures of uh, CAP uh, in Milan because our reality is smaller, of course, uh, but uh, for sure, this topology of uh, plants uh, really allowed us uh, to uh, focus on uh, numerous uh, uh, technologies. Uh, each uh, has uh, its uh, own uh, uh, problems, of course, but we uh, tried to manage this uh, in terms uh, of uh, uh, plants uh, that could be developed uh, in synergy with the different sizes of uh, the plants. Uh, as uh, we are going to then uh, uh, show. You can uh, look at all of the figures on the slides. So 7,000 kilometers of aqueduct uh, network and 5,000 kilometers of sewage network. So we have a fractioned uh, presence on uh, the territory, and we have around 1,500 uh, tanks that we have to manage and monitor. Very rapidly, we want to tell you that we are uh, also tackling the uh, 2030 30 uh, objectives of the UN uh, on the most uh, important ones that we have to deal with are these uh, four. And also, uh, we are fighting against climate change. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we have been uh, pushing on uh, the uh, plant uh, efficiency. And this is, again, another objective we are working uh, uh, hard on. In our sustainability report, uh, we wanted to nonetheless uh, uh, report our most important goals. Now let's focus uh, specifically on the uh, sludge. Purification sludge. We are all uh, uh, working in this field, so we all know what these uh, sludges are. They're not the same thing that uh, many TV shows uh, talk of. And so this is uh, the concentration of uh, the uh, um, manure coming uh, from the fields, uh, so it's not that. Uh, uh, sewage sludge are the, uh, is the product or sub-product of uh, the purification process or treatment. And so these uh, also present uh, opportunities, uh, again, that we want to seize. First of all, costs. It is quite relevant, especially in terms of operating these uh, uh, plants, uh, because you see they represent around 30% of uh, the uh, capex of uh, a treatment plant. Uh, and these costs 
are increasing uh, very, very rapidly, especially in the last few years, uh, both in terms of disposal and recovery of the sludge, uh, because the price per unit was uh, in the past 50, 70 euros uh, per a ton. And now we have uh, uh, 180, and now it's slightly lower, 130, 140 euros. Uh, so practically 100% price increase. In the last uh, six to eight months, uh, well, uh, to these uh, uh, increases, uh, we all know that we have uh, to add uh, the high increase of uh, raw materials, polyelectric electrolytes, uh, uh, energy power, transport. And so, as you might understand, uh, you know, making all this uh, as efficient as possible in uh, managing and treating a sludge is more impor important for the economy. Uh, of uh, the manager. Now the carbon footprint. Well, of course, here we have to deal with digestion and uh, sludge uh, transportation that is uh, uh, mainly carried out with uh, 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 trucks uh, on the road. And uh, then the service uh, uh, laws becomes more and more uh, stringent and strict and sometimes uh, uncertain and difficult to understand and interpret. In the um, European uh, framework, the debate uh, is uh, still ongoing. There are comp uh, sorry, countries like uh, Sweden, uh, Netherlands, and uh, um, which have uh, uh, forbidden uh, uh, to uh, dispose in uh, the farmlands. Uh, Switzerland, uh, after uh, a referendum, uh, has uh, prohibited it and only allows incineration uh, starting from uh, 2026, uh, recovering phosphorus. Other countries like Germany, France, where disposal in the, the uh, farming fields is uh, permitted, uh, uh, but under strict uh, control of the matrix. And there are other Latin countries like uh, Italy, Greece, uh, and Spain, uh, where disposal on uh, farm fields is, uh, in fact, the main uh, way in which uh, we dispose and recover sludge. Anyhow, the trend will be that of limiting more and more this disposal in the uh, farming fields. Another uh, critical uh, uh, aspect is uh, the um, odor. Uh, we uh, live uh, in uh, the uh, Pianura Plain, and so there is a, a high um, rate of inhabitants. And uh, so this aspect is uh, particularly important. And last but not least, uh, the content of uh, pollutants, uh, especially metals and uh, hydrocarbons. So these pollutants are not uh, uh, present uh, in uh, civil uh, disposal. These uh, pollutants are concentrated in sludge when we have industrial uh, waste uh, that uh, most times are not authorized. And this is where we're really working hard on so as to understand and highlight uh, and uh, clean up uh, uh, these uh, um, uh, wastes uh, and these uh, sewages. Uh, our uh, objective as uh, Uniaque uh, is uh, that of uh, reducing the production of uh, the uh, sludge of the water line and the production of sludge. And uh, so the second objective is uh, reduce uh, the um, sludge uh, that are sent to recovery. Third, uh, and uh, extremely important uh, objective, is uh, dropping to zero the um, disposal of waste uh, in uh, the um, landfill uh, so as uh, to recover matter and energy. And then the last uh, and very important objective of our master plan, we want to diversify recovery channels in terms of matter and energy. Because, you know, to minimize the risks linked to the uh, closure 
or a, a blockage of one of the canals uh, where we dispose uh, into. In uh, the present uh, situation, in order to uh, achieve uh, these uh, objectives, uh, well, uh, we spoke of a zonolysis uh, applied to water lines. And at the moment, this uh, technology is uh, uh, not uh, uh, studied uh, yet. But we have installed the process controllers that focus mainly on the alternation of anaerobic and aerobic phases in the water treatment. And the objective of these controllers is that of optimizing the nitrogen cycle and minimizing the energy consumption. And by that, we achieve benefits that are indirect. There are two. The first one is that the biomass uh, undergoes a stress situation, and so it slows down the growth kinetics. And the second one is the fact that uh, during anaerobic uh, stages, we uh, see that we can foster the development uh, of a biomass and uh, accumulating phosphorus, uh, and therefore we uh, minimize chemical doses. So of course, we reduce uh, the environmental impact of transportation and also of chemical sludge uh, that uh, are linked to the chemicals themselves. And so here we are back to the uh, reduction of uh, the um, sludge production in uh, water treatment. We also intervened uh, on the aspect of optimizing uh, line, uh, lines in the plant, and I will go over this very rapidly. In 2021, Uniaque in 2021 had a zero disposal in landfill, and so Uniaque is in the best merit class as far as the M5 indicator of uh, technical quality of Alera and uh, Arera, sorry, and in 20. 20, there was just a slight percentage uh, linked uh, to the um, ongoing uh, validity of a, an agreement, a contract uh, that uh, then uh, was uh, stopped and we uh, managed it then uh, afterwards. And uh, this contract uh, nonetheless uh, did not impact our merit class because the threshold in the passage to the next uh, merit class is uh, really under 1.5, and so we were below that, and so we've always been in the best uh, uh, merit class. 74% of our sludge recovers matter, and 26% recovers uh, energy in co-incineration plants that Uniaqua does not manage, but which uh, we uh, have to deal with because of ongoing contracts. Uh, the production of uh, Uniaque is uh, 37,000 tons uh, per year uh, from 21 to 28 uh, percent uh, on certain plants uh, where we have uh, the best uh, percentages. To date, uh, the plants with ProSet controllers cover 65 percent of uh, total uh, overall production, but in the next two year period, we should cover uh, around 80 percent and we expect a reduction uh, applying this technology by 5 to 10 percent of sludge production. And uh, we will also, by the way, study another uh, technology, uh, nitrogen lysis uh, applied uh, to water treatment. Second step, uh, optimization of uh, the uh, sludge uh, lines of uh, plants. Uh, let me tell you that uh, all of the sludge uh, that we, manu that we uh, produce uh, undergo uh, digestion, and uh, especially in smaller sized uh, plants, uh, in case there is not an adequate uh, treatment of anaerobic or aerobic digestion, well, uh, the sludge is transferred uh, in the liquid form in the optimization plants, to the optimization plants, so as to reduce uh, 
uh, sludge production. I also indicated the uh, technology that we uh, use, the most important ones. You see them uh, listed, uh, aerobic digestion with uh, ozonolysis and uh, cogeneration in uh, uh, Bergamo, 14%. Anaerobic digestion represents 22 percent, and uh, uh, aerobic uh, uh, digestion with the pure oxygen, 14 percent. Aerobic digestion with the pure oxygen, 22 percent, and uh, traditional aerobic digestion, 30 percent. Now, the uh, diversific div diversification sorry, of a final uh, um, uh, disposal in the funding for the uh, sludge lines uh, offered with the National Plan for Recovery and Resilience uh, has uh, allotted uh, uh, um, funding for the uh, biochar uh, plant, uh, gasification plant. We also participated uh, uh, to the uh, production of uh, and drying uh, um, sludge uh, plant in Colonia so that we can uh, work on 25,000 tons more or less of sludge. So. Uh, more or less, uh, the uh, quantity uh, covers 65% uh, of our production. And uh, uh, lastly, we want to devote uh, uh, to agriculture only high quality sludge that re is uh, uh, more or less 27% uh, of our sludge. And in this way, as you can see, we can diversify the uh, final use of our uh, sludge. Uh, drying, of course, uh, allows us uh, to use numerous channels, so co insemination cement uh, plants, uh, and uh, um, in the end, we also have uh, the uh, possibility of disposing in agriculture. Very, very rapidly, a, a slide that uh, um, you can look at uh, and you can uh, view our interventions in yellow, our municipalities, in gray where we intervened, and in white, the municipalities that we do not manage. And as you can see, the intervention is really uh, broad ranging and uh, disseminated. Now, uh, let me uh, speak of the uh, different types of uh, technologies. The first one is the plant in Bergamo. We uh, treat here, we cover here the municipality of uh, Bergamo and uh, other close by uh, municipalities, so 170,000 inhabitants. So recently, we partially updated the plant, and it is uh, made up of uh, uh, grills, uh, um, mechanic settling. Pre-nitrification, uh, 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 system one, uh, secondary uh, pure oxygen and uh, settling. And we also uh, carried out post-nitrification and post-denitrification by adding methanol, uh, just to give you an idea of the water line of the treatment plant. The sludge line has uh, a uh, static and dynamic uh, pre-thickener and uh, an anaerobic, primary anaerobic digestion uh, plant uh, with three parallel tanks, and uh, we call them primary. The third one is an, uh, a secondary anaerobic digester that receives the digestate from the first three. We carried out uh, an in-depth study uh, together with SIAD. Uniaque really studied the application of uh, ozonolysis in the three scenarios that I am going uh, to present. 
The first one focuses on uh, ozonolysis on fresh sludge supplied uh, by one of the digesters. The second one is the application of an ozone stream applied to the uh, exiting digested um, on the one of the primary digestion plants. And the ozone uh, plant uh, focusing on the secondary anaerobic digestion. So the research had different uh, stages. First of all, uh, we had a sampling of fresh uh, sludge and digested. Uh, sludge, and uh, we studied uh, the uh, nitrogen, the suspended volatile uh, uh, chemicals, and uh, then we carried out ozonolysis on uh, various uh, sludge, and I'm sorry, on the three uh, topologies of uh, sludge. The speaker corrects himself. And for each of these, uh, we determined the benefits that could be obtained. So dissolution, dispersion uh, of uh, the uh, carbon uh, uh, substance, uh, the, incre the uh, increase of the settling of uh, uh, sludge, uh, the uh, reduction of uh, the settling of uh, uh, sludge, uh, but we only studied the digested sludge, not the fresh uh, sludge. And the increase uh, of uh, the um, metan uh, origin uh, quality of uh, the digested and the uh, reduction of uh, the DSS. We studied uh, the uh, three scenarios in depth and uh, studying also the pricing, so raw materials. And I do underpin this because it's uh, absolutely important because the world uh, has uh, changed in this uh, uh, from this point of view so we've chosen the best uh, scenario let's wait for the end of the announcement so the best scenario, as I was saying, is uh, the uh, applying a dose of 0 0.05 uh, per a gram of volatile substance of ozone to fresh uh, sludge uh, supplied to one of the primary predigesters. So once we uh, understood that this was the best uh, scenario, and Matteo will focus on that uh, in uh, July, August, and September, we will then proceed to apply this uh, on the field, and uh, we will uh, try it out uh, for 12 months. We will also uh, Study, of course, this is the best scenario, but we do not exclude the, the uh, possibility of applying it to uh, one of the other three. So these are extremely convincing in terms of uh, data. What we're really interested in is to carry out a study uh, as uh, in the case of perform water. And here the scale is uh, uh, broader and larger. So we're working on our own uh, territory, and it's uh, going to be easier to exchange data with, uh, with you all. So very, very rapidly, as my time uh, is uh, running out, so an important focus uh, is uh, aerobic digestion optimized with the off-gas uh, recovery on three of our uh, treatment plants. We use ozone for the final uh, desanification phase. So. We uh, focus uh, on waste, industrial uh, uh, um, waste uh, that uh, come from uh, textile uh, plants. Uh, and so we really needed uh, to degrade these uh, molecules uh, of uh, dyed uh, uh, chemical substances that are the most difficult to treat. Um, the three uh, plants uh, did not recover the uh, stream of uh, oxygen and ozone that was uh, created when using this technology. And so this is how we had the idea in the uh, um, uh, framework of uh, circular economy. The uh, stream uh, that is uh, truly important at technical and economic uh, um, level. 
oxygen was recovered in the water plant on the Casnigo treatment plant and the Colonial Serio uh, treatment plant. The uh, gas uh, flow, this is pure oxygen, by the way, is repressurized through a uh, Venturi system. It's uh, pressurized, as I already said, in uh, the uh, sludge. The uh, sludge uh, is uh, taken from uh, the uh, management uh, tank. We recover oxygen, and uh, we have 95% degrees. And the flow is then uh, re-supplied uh, uh, to the management vat or tank. We achieve uh, the mesophilic uh, conditions. Uh, these tanks uh, work at uh, uh, temperatures uh, that are higher than 35 and 40 degrees. And this allows us to stabilize uh, this uh, even during the winter period of uh, sludge production. And then also, it also uh, allows us uh, to have higher degrees of stabilization uh, in vis-a-vis -vis traditional uh, uh, management over uh, the uh, anaerobic digestion levels. And finally, we also uh, solved uh, the problem of uh, the odors uh, of the plants. Uh, in two plants, uh, we kept receiving uh, uh, um, uh, complaints uh, for the odors, uh, and uh, our interventions uh, hadn't uh, solved uh, the problem. By using pure oxygen, though, we managed to solve uh, this uh, problem for two reasons. First of all, because uh, we uh, achieve uh, a high level of purification, uh, and we therefore reduce uh, odors uh, if uh, the sludge is pure. And then using uh, pure oxygen uh, with a transfer rate of uh, 8%, uh, well, you see the gassy uh, volume that is uh, uh, freed into the atmosphere is really neglectable. It's uh, you know, uh, just a few uh, square uh, cubic meters per day. And uh, we use air, 80% um, of nitrogen, 20% uh, 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 delivery. And so millions of uh, cubic meters uh, per day into the uh, atmosphere that do not have uh, any odor. So return on investment for both uh, interventions was uh, lower than 12 months because uh, uh, thanks to reducing uh, uh, sludge production by 27 percent, we managed uh, to achieve uh, a return on investment uh, that was higher because uh, we reduces, uh, reduced the transportation of uh, uh, sludge and uh, less uh, poly uh, electrolytes. Moreover, these uh, two plants, uh, Colonio and Casnigo, were used uh, as uh, disposal uh, um, plants uh, of uh, uh, wastewater uh, that uh, uh, is uh, received. Uh, let me very rapidly close. Uh, as far as the third project is concerned, which has not been started yet, we have asked uh, for funding to the National Plan of uh, Resiliency and Recovery. It's a challenge, but we want to try it out, by the way. This uh, gasification plant will allow us uh, to uh, supply uh, biomass uh, sludge with uh, uh, water um, bricks, we uh, then have uh, a uh, system of uh, cleaning. We produce a syngas, uh, which is a mixture of uh, methane, just 4%, uh, which nonetheless contains 15% uh, of hydrogen and 10% uh, of uh, um, carbon monoxide. And so this gas burns, uh, and uh, we recover it uh, in a cogeneration plant. Uh, the uh, power is uh, 
then used to make the treatment plant work and consumption is reduced. So this plant, according to our calculations and studies, would work at uh, uh, parameters that are lower than the European uh, taxonomy in terms of uh, treatment plants. Uh, the uh, heat uh, flow generated by the cogeneration is uh, then uh, recovered by the pyrolysis uh, process. And by that, I have concluded. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Matteo. I'm sure that Engineer Caldara wants the floor. Yeah, of course, I have to start by thanking Uniaqua. Now, you clearly are very young, and you might not remember when this uh, a water uh, treatment plan of Bergamo was started. We're talking about 1978. There are people here that were not even born, but that was so important for the city of Bergamo. In those years, there were just a few water treatment plants in Italy that had this secondary treatment line. And I must say that I remember that uh, we were looking at this uh, mixed liquid suspended solid only whether it was uh, like um, uh, polished or, or not. And then, uh, Mrs. Pazinetti uh, joined us. She was uh, a young girl in those years, but uh, she really organized the lab at best, and we understood properly what it meant to do water treatment. And uh, now uh, we have also started this uh, biology lab now. Thank you very much to the municipality, also Bergamo and Uniaque, for having sort of uh, uh, continued on uh, this oxygen treatment line. I know that uh, there were some attacks uh, 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 against this sort of technology um, on the basis of the cost, but uh, I must say, but I'm happy to see that actually the cost per cubic uh, uh, meter uh, uh, um, is not clear, but uh, maybe it would be useful f for us uh, to see sort of a uh, final recap of also these costs because uh, this uh, water treatment plan has been uh, in operation for more than 44 years now, so we do have a lot of experience on that. Um, I'd like to sort of look at the figures in more detail, but thank you. Thank you again to Uniaque that also uh, uh, stood firm uh, against all the attacks that you might have received. And I'm happy that you to hear that you are now trying out uh, a home zone, and I'm sure that the final energy consumption will be lower in this case. Uh, thank you again. Matteo, you want to sort of uh, collect all the questions uh, from the audience or you can reply in to Engineer Caldara. I was not there in 1978. No. Uh, you know, Professor Canciani said that uh, he visited the plant as a student. Uh, well, we're all anxious to start with the how no these is uh, sort of test uh, in Arabi. Uh, of course, you know, what is special is, uh, you know, the period. Uh, so we're going to go deeper uh, on, on that. Uh, and we know the plant, uh, we've been working together for so many years so we're really motivated and we will put all our effort so that uh, uh, we are successful so if there are no further questions I think we can move on and give the floor to Michaela and Eleonora they will uh, uh, focus on a dear topic to engineer Caldala Arioso. so thank you uh, very much to 
um, Theo, and uh, we know that Aerosol is not just for the oxidation tank, and I'll give the floor to my colleagues that have been studying this topic for some years now. If you can please, uh, you know, keep your presentation um, uh, and in 30 minutes, so give us give your presentation in 30 minutes, please. And thank you. Yes, good morning, everyone. I'll uh, introduce myself. My name is uh, Michela Parone, and I work at the biology, environmental biology, biology and chemistry lab as uh, for the uh, uh, for water um, project. We have. You know, the partners that were involved in the project are uh, CAP, ourselves, the Polytechnics of Milan, and IRSA. So, um, in uh, outflows, so, in terms of a treatment plan, well, what are, are these? Uh, First of all, the greenhouse effects, methane, uh, 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 nitrogen peroxide, and uh, also uh, CO2, of course. Among other uh, compounds, we have the volatile organic compounds, the VOC, that uh, can come out of uh, uh, the tanks or uh, the uh, affluents, and then the aerosol um, and the particulate matter. And in particular, those compounds that are very tiny and that can be very uh, harmful for respiration. So the aerosol uh, uh, pro study looked at the process, uh, 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 the entire process. So we assessed the, the sludge line and the emissions to the atmosphere. So we are now focusing in this presentation to um, you know, outflows into the air. And we concentrate uh, on the different uh, um, types that we have been sampling throughout the year. Now here you see the aerial view of the treatment plant and the different uh, uh, points for the sampling. So, um, so at the uh, primary collector um, inlet uh, and then in the denitrification and denitrification on our oxygen tank and then at the sludge line two different checkpoints simply Point, one outside the treatment plant and other two points at the border. In up above, you see the, the uh, you see the plant description in the two boxes below the operational figures regarding the air section and the oxygen, pure oxygen section in terms of the activated sludge. So uh, in general, uh, the, the lower similar, so 007, 009, um, 0 0.09, um, and in terms of the nitrogen load also similar, 1.0, 701.36 and then what uh, was different actually uh, in the two 
or plant is the sort of age of this lad, 30 days for the air section and the 14 days for the pure oxygen uh, uh, section. So we wanted to keep it lower for our purposes as well. So here we present to you the results for the greenhouse gases. In the first two charts up above, you see the trend of CO2 in the air, sorry, in the oxygen tank and in the pre-nitrification tank. And as you see, nothing special to report um, where you have sort of movement where we have uh, you know gas being in, uh, uh, in fired you have a higher co2 emission so we're talking about 7,000 ppm con that are detected continuously in our analysis versus 500 ppm in the denitrification sections where we don't have any movement, uh, stirring of the, the bug uh, or in the oxy oxygen section. So, uh, and then also we carried out an analysis of methane. In this case, uh, you see that methane emissions uh, settled around 100 ppm values in the denitrification tank and in the air one, whereas they reached higher levels in the oxygen tank because in this case uh, the process uh, was with nitro confined so uh, uh, nitrification, denitrification, this uh, 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 leads to denitrification processes and uh, anoxic conditions are created with methane emission. As for the, well, sorry, uh, says the speaker, uh, well, I must say that uh, uh, nitrogen product well that is an element uh, that appears uh, where the plant uh, is under stress and we have highlighted this uh, in particular in the air tank where we had alternate cycles of aeration and sedimentation in this period uh, we detected nitrogen product and methane achieving higher concentrations versus the past. This meant that the uh, uh, management of oxidation tanks is key in terms of the uh, uh, greenhouse uh, uh, gas emissions uh, into the air. Here you see the overall analysis of greenhouse gases uh, as uh, CO2 equivalent grams versus the removed one. So we do, so it's grams out of on kilos. We're talking about the second for CO2 for the air nitrification tank, and we're talking about 10 to the second. Uh, as far as methane is concerned, and tan uh, for the uh, nitrogen prototype and 2O. As for the denitrification tank, uh, where there is no mixing, and the oxygen tank, where the gas uh, is transferred in a more efficient way, well, emissions in this case, if we compare them, are um, two or three times lower. We can move on. And here you see the results of the VOC analysis. 
So we're talking about the volatile organic compounds. Uh, they were present throughout the treatment plant with some peaks at the entrance of the plant and also again on above the uh, uh, reaction tanks where we had more turbulence and stirring. But concentrations all in all are the same throughout to the treatment uh, uh, area. As for the types of VOC, we're talking about to benzene, toluene, uh, uh, thiobenzene, and xylene. Uh, they've been, they represent over 90% of uh, uh, the total VOCs that we have analyzed. And then also chlorinated solvents, uh, tetra, uh, chlorethylene and uh, dichloromethane, detecting only on this huge collector. And then we have also sulfur compounds that have been detected, but less frequently, so not always. Uh, uh, at different a, a points uh, in the plant. And here you see in this chart uh, the different uh, compounds uh, that uh, were detected. Uh, and I'll give the floor now to Eleonora for the bioaerosol analysis. Um, as we said, the other two parameters we took into account uh, were bioaerosol and particulate matter. Now, as for bioaerosol, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, our, our expertise, and we've always taken that into account uh, 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 when assessing our performance uh, uh, in the treatment. But uh, the what's new. For, as far as the Perform Water project uh, was uh, to assess a bioaerosol at uh, um, height and also at five meter height. So we know from literature that bioaerosol is being produced thanks to the stirring and activated sludge tanks. Uh, but also when uh, the uh, wastewater are uh, sort of dumped into the tanks uh, and so yes uh, it's usual that we find aerosol in air but we wanted to understand whether if we go higher up but the bioaerosol will still uh, to be detected as for the sampling points we've had many of them at two different heights as we said so our uh, in terms of the outcomes uh, uh, of this test, well, um, in, in two years, we, uh, this uh, hypothesis is, uh, has been confirmed, i.e. the most significant point for aerosol emission is at the uh, sewage collector, which is indicated in the block spot uh, up above on the left-hand side. Uh, in re which is the 1A sampling point. Uh, that is the only box in the chart where the values are significantly different. Uh, and here we give you also two examples. On a bioaerosol, we do have a lot of data. And here we're just providing uh, some some data, but we do have further information available. So the sewage collector is certainly the most important um, emission point and has for CBD on the right hand side of the air activated and also in the pure oxygen tank. You don't, we don't see significant differences there. And then we also mm, give you the indication of enterococci. And uh, we have again the highest detection at the level of the sewage collector, 1A sampling point. And it, in terms of the bacterial count, that 
aerial solar has been detected and also at five meter height, but of course at lower levels. As for the the chart on the right hand side in violet, um, and the, the two different shades refer to the man's height and or human height and uh, uh, five meter height. What should be highlighted uh, here is uh, the outcome unmold. Uh, if you see the boxes are more or less uh, all at the same height. Uh, oh, what is different are those on the right hand side of the chart that are taller. So in this part of the chart, and this refers to the samples that are taken outside the plant. As Michaela said, we took two reference points, one to the north and one in the, to the south, and uh, in particular on the south next to vegetation. Um, uh, also, in uh, inside the plant uh, and closer to green areas, uh, you detect uh, more mold uh, in air. So we can, uh, you know, infer that actually they come from the uh, uh, environment and are not the presence of molds is not due to the presence of the plant. And then you see the TPC to twenty two degrees centigrade so, uh, in terms of activated sludge and control, severe uh, oxygen on the right hand side. Uh, we see more or less the same values on oxygen. Sometimes uh, we have uh, slightly lower values, but of the same, I mean, in the same trend. But if you look at the extreme right and extreme left, these are the two control uh, points. Uh, these were the points at the border of the plant, east and west in this case. So the two sampling points that uh, had the highest distance, and you see that the concentration there um, is actually lower. In these other charts, we see a different way of representing the data. So we asked ourselves, how is aerosol and bioaerosol varying in the seasons? Uh, since we had the opportunity to study it for quite a long time, we thought we could also check that. And so we divided our data um, in the four seasons. And actually, we're getting quite interesting outcomes here. Mm, uh, maybe not uh, in, in the sake of the integrated tr treatment system, but uh, for science, uh, it might be relevant. And it is important also. Sorry, there are some announcements here. So the speaker stopped. Uh, so we were saying uh, to have some ideas in terms of what to expect uh, for future sampling. So up above, uh, for the four seasons, we have at the two different heights, so 1.5 meter and 5 meter height, the trends in terms of CBT at 22 degrees centigrade, and in autumn, our values are significantly different uh, uh, versus what we detect in the other three seasons. Uh, as for molds, instead, the highest values are to be detected, uh, or, um, and the difference there is really significant. So I was saying higher values in autumn, fall, or in, and in the summer. Uh, as for the chart up above on the right hand side, the light uh, uh, blue is the average of all samplings uh, for the north uh, uh, point. In orange, we see the average of the parameters uh, of the plant. So it's the average for the wa uh, water, uh, wastewater treatment plant, darker blue. The bar in darker blue are the samplings uh, at the south side. Um, 
we wanted to understand, in this case, whether the uh, uh, water uh, treatment plan had an effect uh, on uh, the uh, uh, quality of air. We know that aerosol in air decades in a few tens or hundreds meter, but not beyond that distance, and especially in the summer with ultraviolet rays, uh, the the microbic charge is uh, sort of uh, neutralized very uh, quickly. So when you see molds, enterococcus, and Escherichia coli, and total coliform. So has the four um, the TBC 22 degrees and 36 degrees a slight different uh, between north and south. Has for molds, as we said, we have the highest values in the south because of vegetation and E. coli in this case only inside the plant and not outside. As for the other two parameters, total coliforms uh, here, we detect them also at the south border, but uh, it's uh, an agricultural land, so I might, I, I'd say it's not due to the influence of the plant because uh, the, the, it's a farming uh, land about on the south, and then you see on the right hand side the heterocopsia. And then the wind direction and speed. Uh, well, it seems by now, but actually it was quite hard to detect all of these values and to process the data. And Andrea uh, did a great job in that. Uh, and uh, this allowed us also to understand what was the prevalent wind direction so that we could uh, uh, process the, the data correctly. And do you see the, the wind rows told us that the, the, the main wind direction is not north-south. Uh, we had actually thought that was the main uh, direction, north to south, but actually it's slightly skewed. So, uh, however, the setting was done and we continued on in this way, but it is important to uh, sort of take that into account. Uh, so, now since uh, I have uh, running out of time, I just would like to focus on particular matter where it was for us a first approach in uh, um, studying a particular matter in air. So we set up the sampling system, which was quite a hard job. And also, we had just one sampler, and so we could not do con uh, contemporary sampling, uh, concurrent sampling, but uh, we did so in different dyes. Uh, this is a limitation in the study, I must uh, state that. And as for the analytical part, since the target was understanding where the substances would go uh, according to the mattresses, um, the uh, analytical setup uh, was done to detect fragrances in the particulate. And here you see a few figures. Among the most significant ones, the second uh, on the, so the, the chart on the right hand side, the blue uh, one, the uh, ultra-fine uh, uh, particulates, those that are PMs, are that are those that are most important for human health. So this activity uh, has been carried out only in the, the sampling point. So we uh, are reporting there on the chart. So for PM, we 
have just considered uh, some significant sampling points. So the the, the sewage collector uh, and the two biological tanks compared to what we consider as being white ones. So the northern one for us was important. Uh, Mm, because uh, we have uh, an important uh, uh, road there, a highway, and we thought that the particulate matter could come from that source and not so much from uh, the water treatment plant. This is just to give you an idea of the uh, setting of our work, of the setup of our work. Here you see some results uh, in terms of the PM uh, referring to metals. Unfortunately, we, we don't have all the three dimensions of PM, but it just refers to PM10. As for metals, uh, we're talking about nanograms or micrograms and um, cubic meters. So as for particulate, fragrances have almost always been detected. And of course, fragrances are due to the sewage collector. As for metals, uh, as expected, the source is not, was not actually the highway, but the sewage collector at least uh, in our first uh, results. To draw some uh, conclusions, uh, in this slide, uh, we want to uh, uh, provide you this sort of holistic view um, in terms of the water treatment plant, considering that the organic load of uh, the um, inlet, uh, you know, uh, you see the load there, it's over 2,000 kilogram per day, so 10% of this load has been removed in the uh, oxygen oxidation tank, 58% the air oxidation tank, 24% is went to the, into the sludges and so hence the importance of the sludge matrix which uh, does represent a resource because if we can recover energy out of that sludge and uh, different uh, sort of compounds and then at the outlet uh, it's about nine percent around ten percent and then it was also possible to detect that 0.6% of methane uh, in terms of air oxidation. So one part of the load can be uh, uh, dispersed in air. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very complex uh, work. Um, it's a topic that, of course, uh, we will uh, continue on studying because uh, it, it's an important one. And uh, I think further projects will be carried out at other plants. Um, now we have about half an hour for a coffee break. And then Professor Canziani can start on time. Thank you. And have a nice coffee. So, we resume uh, our meeting. Uh, I will leave the floor to uh, Professor Canziani, who is uh, going to focus on uh, the uh, topic of sludge. I am full professor of uh, the um, Polytechnic of Milano, where I uh, uh, teach wastewater management. I uh, uh, have been dealing with uh, water treatment uh, for 
all of my life uh, as a student in 1978, uh, uh, as a 22 year old, uh, I visited uh, the plant uh, in Bergamo with Professor Bonomo, my professor, and now I teach what he used to teach me. So today I'm going to focus uh, mainly on just one part of uh, uh, sludge treatment that we have uh, researched uh, in uh, the framework of uh, perform water. I am going uh, to uh, speak on the uh, general uh, project and then uh, the uh, do Dr. Pasinetti and uh, Peroni will focus on uh, the uh, results or on the outcomes. So to start with, the general framework means to give you an idea of how uh, all this uh, started. It was uh, started uh, uh, in uh, the mid uh, um, 19th century when uh, Mr. Snow in London found uh, the origin of the cholera uh, epidemics in uh, London. And uh, that uh, is uh, when uh, the uh, water treatment uh, and sewage uh, treatment became uh, very important to avoid uh, sicknesses uh, uh, caused by water. Then uh, the aqueduct pipelines uh, uh, also created uh, the uh, requirement uh, of uh, the uh, sewage uh, pipelines uh, and uh, networks and that was uh, uh, needed because uh, of uh, wastewater uh, treatment so as to avoid diseases uh, that uh, could be um, transmitted by infected uh, water. But also uh, Lake waters, I live close to the uh, Varese Lake, uh, and the water quality decreased because uh, of uh, the 200,000 inhabitants uh, um, discharge of uh, the wastewater into the uh, lake. And even if now we have uh, more than 30 sewage collectors uh, that are working, nonetheless, uh, the uh, lake waters are, are still polluted. Then uh, we, uh, of course, uh, set up uh, uh, wa wastewater treatment uh, plants. And these, uh, of course, uh, have uh, sludges. So we have a new paradigm. Uh, uh, my colleague, Professor Malpega, should have uh, presented the new paradigms of water treatment, uh, but uh, luckily she has, uh, now has uh, COVID, and this is why I keep wearing uh, my face mac. Uh, and w I apply the uh, protocol uh, that we use uh, at the Politecnico. When I'm in the audience, uh, I wear the mask, uh, and when I'm uh, teaching, I don't uh, uh, use it. And these are the measures uh, that we stick uh, to in uh, the Polytechnical University. So the paradigm now, focusing to the maximum level of uh, uh, treated water so as to recover it and use it in agriculture and industry, and uh, uh, also uh, recovering uh, the sludge, we want to recover matter and energy, especially from sludge. Let's uh, remember that uh, f half and three quarters of organic load enters uh, sludges, and this is where hydrophobic uh, uh, matter concentrates. So the sludge line is absolutely a must. If there's a blockage, well, there will be a crisis in all of the plant, and the treatment, of course, will not be carried out. So a unique solution does not exist. And so we have to assess case by case which solution to adopt for any single uh, case. So we should consider specific uh, management criteria and uh, also uh, assess uh, the various technological uh, options that are available. So by considering the whole uh, system when uh, uh, working on the sludge system, we also have to assess the mass uh, uh, load on uh, the whole line. So with the idea of circular economy in mind, we need to understand that no cycle can be 100% closed without spending energy. This is a, a principle of thermodynamics. 
And so now for uh, sludge management, we have various uh, technological options, uh, minimization, stabilization, aerobic, anaerobic, uh, co-digestion with the organic fraction of uh, waste. Then we also have uh, dewatering, mechanical uh, dewatering with uh, thermal drying. And this is just one of uh, the options, and I will not go on and on. And then we also have thermochemical treatments that uh, have come to the forefront because it's an alternative to landfill and agricultural land for those sludges that cannot be uh, disposed in uh, uh, farmland. And uh, you know, uh, also um, landfills is go are going to uh, disappear. And tomorrow, by the way, in Region Lombardy, in the uh, Palazzo Lombardia, we will uh, present an update of the waste management of the Regione Lombardia that foresees zero waste in landfills. So there are numerous options, incineration, co-incineration, like, for example, in the kilns uh, and uh, with the uh, secondary solid uh, uh, fuels, uh, uh, hydrothermal carbonization, uh, pyrolysis, uh, which is endothermic, uh, which means that I will uh, need to uh, supply uh, heat, uh, gasification, which can uh, offer uh, gasified energy, as we saw in the presentation of Engineer Salmano Uniaque uh, speech. Hydrothermal carbonization, so a carbon content that can be recovered and used in different ways if uh, the legal framework will allow th for that. At the moment, it is not possible. It can be fuel for uh, steel works. So since uh, it's not a fuel, uh, a carbon fuel, it will not uh, have that type of uh, problem. And then uh, wet oxidization. I see it here in uh, the Bergamo area, but not uh, uh, in other areas. And there is uh, the problem of uh, the return of uh, nitrogen flows, uh, flows uh, uh, and returns. Uh, I remember that uh, uh, engineer uh, um, Cosotti was working on this specific matter. And uh, if you want further information, you can ask him. So. We always have to wonder about these things. Uh, and uh, in order to make decisions, we have to decide uh, whether uh, uh, we want to save or produce energy. Do we want to recover useful matter? How do we save ma uh, money? How does the system react? Uh, mass and energy balances after the upgrading? And is it socially accept uh, acceptable or will we see uh, numerous uh, committees uh, that will uh, revolt against uh, this decision? And if this happens, why will this happen? Because we have not been able to communicate uh, this uh, at best. Because when this is communicated uh, transparently to the population, normally uh, social opposition uh, is uh, then uh, reduced. So let's see how sludge minimization can occur. First of all, by reducing the uh, dry uh, content of sludge, or in the mainstream of the sludge line, by reducing the draw, uh, mat dry matter with the uh, gasification, with the aerobic or di uh, uh, anaerobic digestion, digesting that uh, uh, causes uh, uh, gas. We can uh, then uh, use a thermolysis or other mechanical lysis to try and maximize the degrading of uh, uh, volatile solids and therefore receive a recovery of energy. <coughs> Then we can also, on the sludge line, reduce both dry matter and water content. 
in this uh, graph, you see how the sludge mass comes from the humid part that is 90 percent water and uh, is reduced after incineration. And uh, you see we have the dry part with no water at all. And so the reduction of volumes is really, really relevant. So what are the technologies that we can use? Um, ozonization, as uh, we've seen, oxidation, sorry. And now on the water line, there is metabolic uh, disc decoupling, uh, result uncoupling, resulting from uh, the uh, stress to biomasses that was uh, oxic settling anaerobic uh, process, OSA and uh, which was uh, used uh, in the uh, cannibal uh, process based on a similar uh, uh, process, uh, on a similar concept. Uh, it uh, did give uh, good results, uh, but in the end, uh, uh, there was n no high return on investment. And so the uh, dangers uh, were higher than uh, the uh, benefits. Uh, We've already asked, uh, we've already seen uh, this example, and now after wondering uh, about uh, the various questions we should ask ourselves uh, before making a decision, one of which is uh, do we want to minimize uh, disposal costs by reducing sludge production? Well, uh, these uh, techniques uh, on the water uh, lines are ideal given that the cost uh, is recovered because we save in terms uh, of uh, the uh, reduction of the uh, waste disposal. Up to four years ago, the plant in Milan, which disposed uh, the sludge in uh, farmland, cost uh, 60 euro per ton. And now we are up to 140 euro per ton. Incineration, given uh, the uh, scarce uh, quantity of plants after a call that was organized a year and a half ago, uh, got to 102 euro per ton in Milan. This was a, a call for tenders. Now we are a little lower, 180. And so there we have increased the uh, idea of you know being prone to uh, building plants uh, to uh, manage the sludge that cannot be disposed in farmlands the region lombardia has reduced er codes for those uh, uh, production uh, plants uh, that can uh, dispose sludges in farmland. For anaerobic uh, digestion, well, uh, we need uh, to uh, uh, increase gas production and we have the uh, gasification of the volatile part. Another question, do we want to maximize material matter and energy recovery? So some of the techniques uh, the most used are okay, and some are not, because if we reduce uh, sludge production, we know that the concentration of metals will be quite high. When reducing this sludge, we uh, uh, could uh, uh, therefore go over the thresholds um, of disposing in the farmland and incineration, because we need to remove the metals before these procedures can be followed. So these uh, ideas of consuming energy and reducing the organic matter at the source uh, are not fit uh, if we wanted to uh, maximize material and energy recover. Uh, boosted or enhanced anaerobic digestion is instead interesting because uh, we can enhance uh, the uh, um, degradable uh, organic matter and uh, transform it into biogas, CO2 and methane, and uh, then uh, produce biomethane. Monoincineration uh, transforms uh, matter in thermo uh, thermal energy, so there are uh, um, ashes that can uh, have, uh, that are rich in phosphorus, uh, six, seven percent as phosphorus, uh, 
in uh, Florida, they produce it at 6% uh, phosphorus, so it's uh, feasible, and then inert uh, materials that can be used in the building uh, industries. But carbon cannot be recovered whilst uh, in the endothermal uh, carbonization allows uh, uh, carbon uh, recovery. So most uh, of the heat is used uh, to dree dry the dewatered uh, sludge. The tests that are carried out in the Milan San Rocco plant have shown that uh, with 33% of dry sludge, it is maintained in the self-combustion. In Zurich, they have an energy sum surplus uh, when doing this uh, procedure that they use as a power and as a heating sources. So this shows that, that this really works. And emissions are one-tenth and one-fifth of law limits for all of the parameters, so it's safe. The alternative is the landfill, but the landfill is the worst possible decision, of course. Those who are against, uh, to, uh, against mono incineration and accept uh, the idea of uh, landfills are uh, against uh, environment protection. So it's up to those who are skilled and competent to explain it to those who demonstrate uh, and march in the streets. Uh, because they do not know uh, anything about these uh, technologies. Now let's uh, uh, focus uh, on uh, the uh, research of SIAD. With SIAD, uh, we've started this research 14 years ago with the Bulgaro Grasso um, plant. And, uh, the new uh, tests uh, carried out in San Giuliano confirmed those results, uh, where it was even more difficult uh, to uh, confirm uh, reduction because a uh, textile uh, uh, waste uh, was uh, full of fibers. Uh, nonetheless, we have reduced that fraction, and it's even uh, uh, lower because we have more biodegradable uh, uh, component. So we tried to understand the best dosage to reduce uh, sludge production to the, um, mo the lowest uh, quantity and uh, ozone uh, use, uh, and uh, also understand the effects uh, on biomass. Uh, and so we have to study that. So these are the main schemes. Uh, the first one is uh, receiving uh, the influent and uh, doing oxonization, and then uh, influent uh, from uh, uh, the uh, settling one to the bioreactor, and then uh, ozonization. So this is the setting that was used in uh, Bulgaro Grasso. This is the second uh, um, scheme that we used uh, in San Giuliano. The first effect uh, we uh, saw was uh, a high level of settleability of sedimentation. So the, uh, if uh, uh, we keep a higher MLSS concentration in the bioreactor, and if necessary or convenient, we can operate at a higher sludge age. So we had an SVI from 120 to 75 ml slash GSS. And uh, you remember how this uh, test, uh, uh, Michela Peroni, Mr. Calvi, and uh, you know all the uh, collaborators of uh, SIAD. It was an important experience for all of us. Uh, so uh, it was uh, a very, very important uh, uh, experience for all of us. Then we studied uh, another modeling in uh, order to assess uh, the effects of ozone on biomass by having a setting without ozone and with ozone engaging in bi um, biomass on respirometric tests. And so the 
uh, cellular recovery. And we saw the uh, reduction with this respirometer uh, stage, so 0 0.68 for 0 0.02. On nitrification, again, we saw that uh, uh, with ozone, the nitrification activity grew. And the interpretation, and uh, uh, you will uh, focus on it m more and better, so the uh, quantity allows a greater penetration in the flock, and so in the flock, nitrification are protected by catalases uh, because of the bacteria that are on the external part of the flock. And so there is no attack of the ozone. They grow quite well. And in fact, they have a better yield. And then in terms of percentage, they uh, are higher than in normal plants. Now here the slide is not, uh, 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 has not been designed uh, very easily uh, and the, the figures uh, do not uh, come up on the slide. Anyhow, growth and uh, decay have uh, been uh, uh, tested with uh, respirometric uh, methods and the growth here was very high at the beginning so as to assess the growth uh, uh, percentage uh, during the day. And then, then the long-term tests show that there is a trend to reduction, which is uh, the decay um, trend. And in fact, we saw that the uh, uh, decay coefficient is uh, higher and the growth uh, trend is lower, which means that ozone has an effect on YH. So more uh, energy is consumed and becomes a biomass. Nonetheless, the action uh, kills uh, bacteria. Uh, some of the bacteria then uh, uh, help the decay. And species are selected that have a constant growth that is slower. If we consider the uh, specific sludge production vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, removed uh, COD, we see the uh, overall yield for the managers and uh, of the plants uh, and the decrease uh, is uh, the result of ozone, of, uh, ozone lysis. In the end, uh, we uh, assessed uh, all of the uh, causes that could reduce uh, sludge production. So 50% is uh, due to solubilization and oxidation of solubilized particulated CO2. But 40% is a result of the lower net biomass growth rate. So uh, if we have uh, uh, less uh, births uh, and uh, more uh, deaths, uh, of course, uh, the production has a lower cell uh, growth uh, because of the enzymes uh, that, uh, that protect us uh, from a zone. And uh, uh, by this, uh, I have uh, concluded uh, my uh, presentation. If you have uh, questions, uh, I am here at your disposal, and uh, I will uh, reply. Uh, yes, I believe uh, that uh, we have uh, questions coming up. Uh, let's see if we see anybody raising their hands. Uh, yes, um, Professor Bissolotti, thank you very much for your presentation. We uh, know each other for we've known each other for years. So uh, we know the outcomes of the Purple Water uh, Project. What about the data vis-a-vis -vis, uh, world uh, literature results? Uh, how do these uh, compare? What is the benchmarking? Is there a great delta? Is there uh, uh, an, an envisaged direction that we may follow? I can say that we are in line with uh, worldwide uh, experiences. Uh, initially, ozone levels were extremely high now. Uh, 
uh, and I will uh, receive uh, the latest figure in terms of uh, doses. But we are up to uh, very, very small doses uh, with reductions uh, by 25 to 50 percent of uh, uh, sludge production. So more ozone, less uh, sludge. In Bulgaro Grasso, in that uh, plant, uh, and it was also carried out in the Ariana Depur uh, plant, they increased the dose of ozone when the price of uh, the sludge uh, that they have to dispose of increases uh, so as to maintain an economic uh, uh, balance uh, for the company. If it costs 100 euro per ton, I can use that ozone to reduce it. If it's 140 euro, uh, euro I uh, therefore uh, save in this sense. So ozone is used like an, uh, you know, the gas pedal in a car to uh, assess how to uh, spend and save money. So after 14 years of experience here and there, and uh, comparing to international uh, data, I would say that for small and medium-sized plants that do not have an aerobic digestion, want to reduce uh, sludge uh, uh, cost, uh, um, this is absolutely uh, a feasible uh, solution. And this is not uh, um, an advertisement for uh, any company. We've really studied this. Yes, and even the yield uh, figure 70% of Japanese uh, pen patents, uh, 10. Uh, and then uh, uh, nitrification that was our concern and phosphorus. Uh, so we really saw that if the plant is uh, well designed, there is uh, a 30% that can be um, guaranteed. And so each plant has to be studied so as to achieve the best results. Uh, anyhow, future developments uh, will uh, move in the direction of uh, micropollutants. Uh, and uh, this is, in fact, our idea. We have, in fact, presented uh, a patent uh, uh, application in uh, a post-COVID uh, situation. We are all more aware, more environmental friendly. And we want to consider the possibility of a self-production of ozone and oxygen. So it's not up to the gas cyst uh, manager. Why is this expensive because of oxygen? No, no, buy it from us. So spend uh, less energy, use produce uh, oxygen, you create a zone, and you offer two or three services, minimization and water waste, uh, uh, pipelines, um, then uh, recovery. If there is an anaerobic digester, then uh, we are studying the valorization of biogas. And uh, then uh, uh, we are wondering about uh, the uh, sludge uh, de um, uh, treatment uh, so as to avoid odors and fragrances uh, uh, where aerosol is a uh, high impactor. So this is a new life uh, of uh, something that we had studied 20 years ago. Uh, we were very happy of uh, those uh, uh, studies, uh, but uh, they uh, were never put into practice. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Kanzian. And let's uh, give the floor to Eleonora and Michela. Thank you very much to Professor Kanziani. And actually, I was reminded of Professor Bonomo. With Professor Bonomo, we actually, you know, when we decided about the Bergamo uh, water treatment plant, but with Professor Bonomo, we also went to Norway to have a look at the plant for the cartoness uh, use, uh, that's that material. So I'm pleased, really pleased to rem remember uh, Professor Bernal. Well, he's very well. He was very. I haven't seen for a while, him for a while, but uh, yeah, his he'll be 82. Uh, I'll be celebrating his 82, so his 82nd uh, uh, birthday. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so our last presentation. So the application of ozone and the water treatment line, and in particular on the a biological oxidation tank. In uh, our task in the perform water project, uh, we used ozonolysis uh, on our biological process. Uh, on a semi-real scale, you see the arrows there. We mentioned the ozonolysis for anaerobic digestion. For us today, we focus on ozonolysis and biological oxidation. So here you see this is our biological tank, uh, 450 cubic meters of what we fill in, so has uh, to maintain operational uh, conditions that are uh, equal to the real ones. Retention time is between six to eight hours, and the sludge load is 0 0.0, 0 uh, 7, 8, uh, uh, and keeping, however, the um, uh, age of sludge at around 14 days. Whereas uh, uh, the, the real scale one had uh, uh, longer periods. So now here, we would uh, sample part of uh, a sample of the sludge, and then there was a contact of the sludge with ozone determined by the with with this uh, sort of uh, generator with 1.8 uh, kilograms per hour as for the you know uh, experimental steps uh, so different steps of functioning and uh, stopping hazonolysis so has uh, to compare the performance with and without uh, uh, ozonolysis uh, 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 functioning. So here you see in green with ozonolysis, uh, in uh, black those lines uh, refer to uh, the process without uh, ozonolysis. Um, the test uh, was carried out throughout a year, so the duration of the test was for one year. But unfortunately, COVID. Uh, uh, forced us to co concentrate on our test because we actually were also, uh, the, the, the process was stopped for four months. Now here you see in general the performance of the biological process, uh, operational conditions that we have already uh, mentioned before. All in all in terms of performance and the different uh, 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 analyzed uh, parameters. Uh, look at the COD in lat. It's 140 milligram per liter. So very low uh, values. Mm -hmm. um, that was a bit detrimental in terms of applied load. So we were going out at 32. Dissolved fraction in 32 out 19. The BODCOD ratio was around 40%. No BOD at the outlet. The suspended solids were around 70 milligrams per liter, and outlet at the outlet was, was eight. Uh, TKN in at the inlet around 20 milligrams per liter at the outlet four. As for ammonia, on average, we're talking about average daily rates. We were in with 13, out with two. Nitrates, the inlet 1.4, at the outlet 7.8. We have um, uh, set up a combined uh, uh, nitro nitrification denitrification box to, there was no biodegradable load, so we could not uh, denitrify uh, everything because BOD was not there. And uh, 
this is what you also can see in the chart. The last chart regards the redox potential. And here you see that we keep uh, positive values. Um, even though this, n despite this uh, nitrification, denitrification combined process. Now, what you see here is a trend in time of suspended solids uh, in the tank. We wanted to represent it because uh, this is like a, a picture, a snapshot uh, uh, of the plant throughout the experimental period. The, the, the test period. In red, there were some dysfunction events, some faults. In October 2019, there was a first flush event due to very intense rain after a, a, a dry season. So the sludge um, uh, actually uh, were overflowing from the primary settler due to this heavy rain. And then there was another dysfunction on the oxygenation system. And in this case, there was a plant shut down due to a failure in the level pump. So the pump that would keep the level at 450 cubic meter. Um, in green, uh, the boxes in green, uh, they refer to the uh, uh, operating periods for ozone leases. So we compared these uh, uh, green periods with previous and following periods, uh, uh, i.e., before the ozone leases and after ozone leases. Uh, those ludges, as for the large production, well, from uh, 2 to 4.5 gram TSS per liter with an organic fraction of 0 0.65, uh, 0 0.75. Uh, I wanted to uh, highlight the light brown series represents the SVI, the sludge volume index, which represents the capability of the sludge to sediment to settle, therefore to occupy less volume. So once the ozonolysis is switched on, SIV collapses, goes down. And here we, we switch on, and it goes up, it switches off, and it goes uh, to 200. And then it comes down to 100 when we switch on ozonolysis. So the ozonolysis on the sedimentability of the sludge, as Professor, Professor Scanziani said, is actually evident and immediate. And this is a, a significant uh, a, a piece of information because this allows us to concentrate sludge. So a reduction in the SIV of the order of 15 to 30 percent. And here you see the results uh, that we obtained. How much ozone was dosed? Well, about seven grams per TSS kilogram uh, in terms of exposed sludge. So uh, the ozone dose in the contact reactor. The ozone dosage allowed us to reduce the specific sludge production, i.e., the TSS grams versus the uh, COD remove the removed COD grams. So no zonalysis from 0 0.77 to uh, 042. So a considerable reduction by 39 percent. A mid reduction in the sludge production by 39 percent. This reduction varied from 24 to 48 percent. That was the range, 24 to 48, with an average value of 39 percent. We also calculated the, the ozone dosages versus the uh, avoided TSS, so to 
this is important to assess the sustainability of the process. This tells us how much ozone I need to eliminate a certain quantity of sludge. So this parameter is to be then compared with what I have to sort of spend to dispose uh, of the same quantity of sludge. So if the ozone price is is, la is lower, then it is worthwhile doing so. And here we are talking about 90 grams per kilogram in terms of TSS avoided, and the range was between 55 to 131. And here in this chart, we see the trend at the different uh, stages and phases of the test uh, on the basis of the uh, TSS avoided, so the remove, the CO2 removed. So we start 0.7 with ozone in green. You see that production uh, decreases. As for this uh, box plot, um, which shows the functioning of the plan till February 2020. So from July 2019 to uh, during 2020, this refers to the pre-COVID period. The biological plant before the COVID period was functioning totally in, fully different in a different way. And so uh, we could not compare with, with the before and after, so we could not keep that uh, uh, data. And we had just to analyze the data from COVID onwards. Uh, and also, Eleonora will show you the differences on the basis of the waste water that was fed. Um, you know, considering what we have said before, then you need to understand whether it is uh, convenient to use this process. And you just analyze the value with regard to the avoided sludge. Considering a, a price of 2.53 euro per kilogram and 150 euros uh, per ton of sludge to be disposed, then you can uh, have a, a saving of about 15 to 20 percent in terms of disposal costs. Just focusing on disposal costs, not on the uh, uh, management costs for the plant. Professor Kantsiani uh, that followed this activity uh, through a, a master degree thesis carried out actually uh, 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 an analysis by comparing the costs of a plant with just oxygen versus a plant that includes ozonolysis. So in this case, we see that the higher the potential of the plant, the higher the saving. And here you see euros per day that you can save. The use of ozonolysis uh, depends also on the cost of uh, on on the cost of. Uh, uh, the disposal for the sludges. So if the disposal costs are over 60, 80 euros, then there is an advantage for it. So we do confirm sustainability. Going back to what we said yesterday, the process has to be looked at uh, in terms of its applicability. And here we confirm that the process is sustainable. So we can say that the higher the disposal cost, the more interesting this process is to uh, uh, achieve a saving. Um, now the floor goes uh, to Eleonora, who will tell us more about uh, this ledger. Yes, as Professor Kansani said, 
uh, we also performed some lab tests to check that ozone was not interfering negatively on the biomass, uh, mainly the nitrifying one. But uh, carrying out respirometric tests at lab level, we also, uh, as I said before, assess the cell uh, yield uh, and uh, so the free first uh, 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 three columns they are up above so the, you know we said but we could not consider the data collected before 2019 but so this data refers to the heterophobes uh, bacteria and as the ALB so what do we can, can we deduct from this uh, without a zone we have a 0 0.68 value and then with a the zone we go down to 0 0.55 the same type of uh, decrease is to be seen also in the following year in 2021 so you see without ozonolysis and with ozonolysis in terms of the growth rate from six we go down to four from four we down to four point five uh, so this tells us that ozone uh, uh, has an effect on uh, the uh, AO this is what we actually want to achieve so ozonolysis this process that we want to apply does what it should so we should to be surprised of the lower yields this is what we have to expect as for the last column in the slide this is the speed of nitrification as Professor Canciani said, also in this case, and that was a bit of a surprise for us, figures seemed even too beautiful, so to speak, and we repeated the test several times because nitrification, as we thought, that could increase, but not by two or three times. So these uh, were surprising outcomes. And the same um, uh, sort of uh, uh, type of assessment was also carried out uh, in terms of uh, uh, the traditional microbiolog microbiological tests. So look at the chart below and look at in particular to the lines above. You see the Polyforms, all of the different uh, uh, bacteria, and we have the pre COVID and so during and past COVID, as Michaela said. And we have noticed something interesting in terms of the generic material counts, no big variations pre, during, and after COVID, but unexpectedly. And it was hard to interpret this. So the nitrifying bacteria decreased significantly. Now, such bacteria are represented by the dark green dots referring to the air plant. Now, we had to compare with something, so we had to make a comparison. You know, the, t the plants are, yes, similar, but to this large uh, age is different. And uh, so the, the nitrifying uh, with O2 are the boxes uh, in green again. So what we could say is that we have been confirmed by the fact that the nitrification uh, uh, was not uh, uh, reduced by uh, the ozonolysis process. Then another assessment that we carried out in the lab to assess whether the nitrifying biomass was not inhibited was carried out by Michael Bellucci 
uh, in the polytechnics, uh, who is now working at ISPRA, and she carried out a more in-depth analysis with advanced molecular techniques to assess whether the uh, 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 the uh, uh, nitrifying bacteria were still sort of uh, in a healthy state uh, before, during, and after ozone, and uh, oh, three to seven percent variation was uh, uh, detected during the ozonolysis versus against the six, seven percent uh, plant was detected in the biomass that did not go through ozone or least. So we do have some differences there, but mm, uh, the same sort of uh, uh, range of magnitude. And so uh, we are not have not identified the particular uh, issues uh, in terms of inhibiting the nitrifying biomass. As for the assessment of the uh, uh, biological process, uh, well, we have used optical microscope to look at the so-called microfauna. So bacterial, those that remove uh, the biological virus. So we're talking about a higher level here of bacteria. Microfauna can be used as an indicator of the health of the sludge. And so we assessed also this aspect. Other parameters that we took into account and that we studied uh, besides the structure of the flock, but we have also assessed the filamentous bacteria in terms of uh, them being present and uh, the characteristics. And so if we look at the chart on the left hand side, we have three charts and we again make a distinction between the pre-COVID period and uh, the COVID period. So within the black box, uh, which is the period we're focusing on, we have uh, two green rectangular boxes uh, when a zone was activated. And so we look at the population density in the microfauna and then also the specific diversification of the microfauna and uh, the filamentous bacteria index. So we give, this gives an idea of how much bacteria is present in the blocks. In the two periods when ozonolysis was activated, uh, if you look at the trend in red and blue, blue means air plant that was used as a comparison uh, versus uh, the uh, red uh, outcomes for the oxygen tank. So there is not much of a difference. Whereas in the second phase, we started seeing an effect that is as for microfauna, no big differences were noticed. Uh, if not, when we switched up the second phase of the zone with an increase in microfauna for the oxygen plan. Uh, as for diversification, as a negative as a release is a fact was uh, detected in the second experimental stage with a decrease in the number of species present. And as for the filamentous bacteria index, so we noticed a slight decrease that was even though significant for one class, class three, actually class three and four, but of course only for the uh, um, oxygen plant. So what does it mean class three and four? Well, class three, this means the presence of 20 filamentous bacteria present per flock three is from one to five. So 
uh, we, we don't notice the, the disappearance. So we are improving the situation vis-a-vis -vis the filamentous bacteria, but not a, a big uh, um, impact. Whereas in terms of the, uh, of the eye, we have seen uh, quite an impact. So on this large volume index, there was an impact. At macroscopic, microscopic level, here you see the activated sludge. Uh, well, you can detect that effect on filam filamentous bacteria. The, the, the filament has been emptied, uh, for example. So, oh, maybe filaments uh, with uh, empty spices, so missing cells in the filamentous bacteria chain. So, we could confirm the effect of ozone with the uh, optical microscope. And another effect that we actually detected on microfauna is this. Now, these are um, organisms uh, uh, that belong to the microfauna, and they stay with that sort of a lag attached to um, it and we should have cellular bodies there, but they are not there. So this to better, uh, you know, show you. This is what Michaela is now sort of pointing out to. So we do see an effect on microfauna in the second phase, since the role of such microfauna uh, for this kind of protozoas are uh, being having them a function of filtering water. Well, we made the hypothesis that this negative effect of a zone was to be visualized with the presence of some opaqueness in the certain outtent of the sludge. Mm, the cones. Uh, uh, had been uh, uh, up to that point quite clear, but then they start becoming opaque. And so we thought that that was a secondary effect uh, of the, the um, ozone process. Uh, uh, but all in all, in terms of respirometric tests uh, and assessments of the kinetic parts, observation by um, uh, the microscope, uh, and so on and so forth, well, all in all, uh, we can say that the process had a positive effect. Thank you, Michaela. I was forgetting something that is actually very important. What Michaela is showing you, the two pictures, this is a, with a magnification of 1,000. You might see me, you don't see much, but uh, those sort of balls that you see there are, are nitric fine bacteria aggregates. Um, air oxygen difference, and especially in this picture here, during the ozonolysis process, well, we noticed that the nitrifying uh, bacteria clusters were halved. So they, they concentrated very much. This is the interpretation we gave. So when we say that an active sludge is more specialized with uh, oxygen also means this, that the microbic flow uh, uh, that develops. So when we say that it specializes, this is what we mean. Also in terms of the size of the flock, 
As Professor Canziani said, these flocks become more compact, or these clusterings become more compact, and this is also why the as the eye uh, improves and sedimentability improves. Uh, this, the difference is, is significant. In the case of the air that's plant, the structure of the flock is more diffused and you don't see very much the difference. Or, whereas in the oxygen plant, the flocks are smaller in size, but that are more compact and the, the higher SVI in the air plant is not only due to the filamentous bacteria present, uh, sometimes they create bridges um, between the flocks, but they were creating a, a little bit more open structure and that bit of a zone allows to decrease by one class the filamentous bacteria so that this flock could be a little bit more compact. This is what we have given as a sort of an hypothesis. So we uh, also uh, attempted an analysis uh, in terms of uh, uh, emerging micropollutants and in uh, the uh, waste uh, of the biological plant and on the sludge. And what we saw is uh, that there is an increase uh, of uh, galaxolide and tonalide in the effluent of the uh, treatment plant with ozonolysis. But no evidence appeared in terms of uh, galaxolidone and uh, also of uh, reduction of contaminants on sludge. So these are some first results uh, that we should go uh, deeper into. But nonetheless, uh, we want to uh, convey them to you so as to uh, give a contribution on micropollutants as well. So to conclude, this process shows uh, that there is a reduction of uh, uh, sludge production. It improves the sludge sedimentability. It does not interfere with the overall performance of the biological uh, process. And uh, even if we saw it in some uh, situations, but not throughout the whole experiment, it is potentially possible to uh, see an uh, uh, increase uh, of uh, the um, organic matter that will be dissolved uh, thanks to potentially optimizing the denitrification uh, process. And moreover, to optimize uh, the biological process, and this is something that we have already uh, conveyed uh, to the audience. Now, what uh, should we envisage for the future? Well, uh, the uh, attempt uh, is that of uh, applying this uh, process on uh, uh, large-scale plants. And uh, given the fact that we do not have a lot of time, we just tested one dose, the seven uh, grams uh, we spoke about, uh, grams uh, kilo. So it would really be great uh, to uh, uh, try and test various uh, ozone doses and see what uh, we can achieve. Moreover, we would also like, and Professor Canziani has already started this process, uh, we would like to uh, mod give a model of the whole uh, uh, process, of the overall uh, uh, process of the wastewater uh, treatment plants. And then uh, we launch this provocation, this question, where is it better to apply ozonolysis in uh, biological oxidation or in anaerobic digestion? Well, we still don't have uh, a, an, an answer that goes in the same uh, direction. It depends uh, on uh, the uh, way in which these work, but both have shown a reduction of uh, sludge production. 
So we have concluded our presentation. So I'm sure there are questions. Or maybe um, Engineer Caldara can close uh, our uh, three days uh, work. You have a question, but you also have uh, the closing remarks uh, you uh, are responsible of. So I'm going to surprise you. Do you remember how we started with uh, oxygen? The idea was started in 1965-70. So what Union Carbide found uh, in their uh, data sheets, uh, you could see the SVI graph. Uh, so with uh, the same uh, quantity of MLVSS in the reactor, the trend was uh, different. SVI had a different uh, uh, speed of uh, settling, uh, which was higher with the outcome showing that we could use uh, inside the reactor, and I'm talking of the 70s, uh, and those were air plants, uh, the concentration of the MLSS of uh, 2,000 milligrams per liter. And with oxygen, we immediately thought for five, six uh, milligrams per liter, and then we were set on four. So now, considering uh, the results of this experiment, uh, that you have tried it in uh, oxidation tanks uh, with ozone, well, of course, this has immediately shown that the increase of uh, sedimentation speed, uh, this is the result, in fact, uh, with the compactness of the flock. Uh, and so I would have asked, uh, so uh, does ozone kill bacteria? Instead, it doesn't uh, appear as it uh, has killed the bacteria. So the result is truly interesting. So um, the question is, uh, have you thought of increasing the mass inside the reactor? So uh, moving from four to f uh, five uh, micrograms per uh, cubic meter up to 10? Because you see, this would be a revolution in uh, the terms uh, of uh, how we consider the uh, wastewater uh, treatment plants. So the increase uh, of uh, bacterial mass is not an advantage, because when we increase it, uh, we also increase uh, uh, the inert uh, matter. So it's useless to maintain 4 and 5 is ideal, therefore. At 10, the viscosity increases, and so the efficient uh, quantity of oxygen decreases. So it's not a convenient decision. And uh, so 10 is uh, the maximum of operation, but it will impact uh, aeration. So when uh, the uh, sludge uh, is uh, older than 15 days, uh, there is an increase of uh, volatile inert mass. Uh, and it's useless again. And so we will have a consumption of the substratum that uh, is then transferred to anaerobic digestion. And therefore, you should decrease it. And so to maintain in the solids the biodegradable part uh, so depending on what you have and what you want, uh, you need uh, to uh, uh, do the maths. Uh, so normally, we remain at 4 and 5. Uh, 10 uh, is uh, feasible, but only uh, in emergency situations uh, when there is a high production of sludge. So it's only an, em an emergency uh, possibility. Oh, yes, uh, I did not uh, think of the inert uh, matter. But in fact, Professor, 
You spoke of the flexibility of uh, the load uh, uh, variation. In fact, uh, uh, treatment plants uh, work in the summer three or uh, four fold vis-a-vis uh, -vis the normal uh, load. Uh, so thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, really great. You want to add something? So I would l just like to close uh, uh, with uh, the answer. I am a gasist uh, expert, uh, so this is not uh, terrible for me. In a civil uh, plant, uh, it would never work uh, at 10. But in industrial plants, we have numerous different figures. The limit of 45 on NPR, uh, on the thermal plant, uh, it's really, it really looks uh, like uh, the uh, OFMS uh, uh, W. So the limit of the mass uh, transfer is uh, something that we can gauge. Uh, gauge. So the idea of uh, having a higher uh, uh, concentration was what we saw in Austria. There are, were no oxygen plants. Uh, and we said, uh, well, we will increase it by two grams per liter. And they said, no. And they said, what if there is a, a, a lot of rainfall? Uh, uh, we will uh, end up in prison. And it was uh, very uh, strange for us, a uh, very small size. In the Zonde Zurich, I had uh, um, a file where they measured every six hours uh, the level of uh, sunshine, temperature, humidity for 150,000 inhabitants. Uh, so this is something that uh, is really uh, surprising. So you feel very strong with uh, oxygen, and so you overcome certain problems. I have just a, a remark. Uh, why does it uh, sediment uh, so rapidly? One of my ideas uh, is uh, that the uh, hydrophil uh, impacts uh, are more highly oxidated by ozone, and so they uh, are oxidated, they disappear, and the hydrophil uh, part uh, has uh, the uh, sludge uh, uh, settle. Yes, it's the polymeric matrix uh, which uh, works uh, as if it were a glue. The components of the flock, uh, I mean, uh, the action of the ozone is there. And so this uh, helps uh, to uh, compact the flock and so uh, the uh, settleability. Uh, results. Uh, yes, and CO, COH uh, are those molecules that can be oxidated thanks to the hydrophil uh, uh, part uh, or section. Are there other questions? So if there are no further uh, uh, questions, I will sit here with my colleagues. Uh, they have really been uh, great, uh, competent, and skilled. Uh, they are great uh, in uh, carrying uh, uh, out uh, their job. Uh, so thank you very much to the teamwork, uh, Kappa University, the audience, uh, uh, Francesca, and those who are not here. I have not worked on this project, but uh, it has uh, been an ongoing project. Uh, and today, I. I have learned uh, a lot in these three days uh, of conference. Uh, I, I didn't even imagine uh, the uh, difficulties uh, of working in those uh, periods. Uh, uh, and so thank you very much for your work. Uh, and so before giving the floor to uh, Mr. Caldara, our engineer, he will have the closing uh, remarks. Uh, as uh, a hydraulic engineer, I could really compare the needs of uh, uh, the business, which is something we cannot do uh, without, uh, and uh, my background, uh, my academic background, uh, and I have kept uh, learning, learning and learning. Uh, and it's not that easy, you see, to f 
have a working position that allows you to always be updated. And we're really always uh, very, very careful. We are always, uh, you know, uh, investing in time and money and uh, enthusiasm. We have a lot of drive and passion as a group, uh, and we're really motivated uh, to do our best. So thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you to our company, SIAD. Uh, now let me leave the floor to the general director. I would just like to add, uh, and uh, I also like to speak on behalf of uh, all of the group, uh, it's not a must, it's something that I feel. This uh, is uh, uh, the possibility of uh, working in a field that is beautiful. And thank you very much, uh, Ricardo, because you've been a wonderful moderator. And thank you to all of uh, the colleagues of uh, the company who really supported us because, you know, uh, behind these uh, seven uh, people who have taken the floor, there are so, so many employees uh, who have uh, supported us in HR, technical department, and uh, so thank you, uh, Mrs. Pazinetti. I really uh, would like to underpin that with uh, this uh, conference, uh, we also took uh, made a great decision, i.e. to make available to everybody what we've been uh, working on. I remember Professor Bonomo when we debated initially uh, these uh, um, ideas, why don't we use uh, oxygen in uh, treatment plants? And Professor Bonomo said, uh, well, how can we do that? You are the only company who is focusing on oxygen. So now, today, we make uh, these uh, possibilities available to everybody. So oxygen uh, that can be uh, bought uh, also from other companies. Uh, so um, not only treatment plants, but also production plants. Uh, so we will start uh, by designing uh, plants uh, and uh, support uh, to plants uh, design and planning. So uh, oxygen and ozone production plants uh, where you can buy uh, ozone and oxygen from. So we, of course, make our machines available, but there are other manufacturers. We feel safe and uh, secure in disseminating what we have learned. And uh, we say, uh, okay, let's uh, see which machines uh, are uh, available uh, and working also with our competitor. So clients and customers should not only depend from our supply. So we also can uh, tell our customers, you can go and buy the machines uh, from uh, different companies uh, so that you are not uh, obliged uh, to, uh, you know, being linked uh, to the oxygen uh, supplier. I think this is a great step forward uh, for our company. So we're not uh, one of the greatest companies working uh, uh, in this field, but uh, we uh, are offering our know-how and we are amongst uh, the most important companies and best companies uh, working in this uh, field. So thank you very much, Professor Canziani and uh, the Politecnico of Milan that can really do a lot to support us in terms of education. And uh, we really believe uh, that using oxygen is not linked uh, to the uh, supply offered uh, by a company. As Professor Bonomo said, uh, how can we propose uh, a, a municipality when uh, the municipality knocks on our door and asks for a uh, um, treatment plant uh, uh, that works with oxygen and they wonder, is a SEAD uh, supporting this. So we want to be 
free of this idea. We want the, the uh, universities to say that oxygen can be manufactured uh, with machines uh, that are available from many companies, not only us. Uh, and then thank you very much to Mrs. Mapei. I'm very sorry that she's not here because I wanted to introduce something new for the uh, future. Mrs. Mapei. Uh, in the last uh, few years, I uh, started saying, why don't you start uh, uh, trying a hydrogen inside uh, the anaerobic digester? If you add a hydrogen, what will happen in uh, the anaerobic digester? Think of plants, CO2, H2O. The leaf really uh, separates water into hydrogen and oxygen thanks uh, to the sunlight. If we put uh, hydrogen in the anaerobic digester, bacteria will do what plants do. CO2 plus hydrogen produce. Uh, the uh, first uh, step is methane, but then uh, they can also produce uh, C6O1206 uh, plus oxygen. And so it's something that is really surprising. And it's remarkable because this is what we're trying to do together with the Politecnico of Milan to focus on uh, this uh, reaction for uh, mankind, CO2 plus uh, 4DHO2 that uh, uh, causes uh, CH4 plus 2H2O. So in the anaerobic digester, you saw the bacteria. So these are the uh, new uh, uh, results uh, from uh, the uh, biologists uh, coming at f from the labs. You know, with the Polytechnic of Milan, it's two or three years, in fact, that we have been trying to determine the size of the reactor, first stage, second stage, uh, catalyst, rutilium, to uh, achieve this reaction. CO2, it uh, sounds uh, absurd. We don't uh, want uh, to hear hydrocarbons and uh, methane. We are attempting uh, to produce synthetic methane, CO2 plus uh, H2, that uh, gives a CH4 and uh, H2O. So this reaction that dates back to the uh, um, initial uh, uh, 20th century is something that NASA is uh, studying to have uh, water on Mars. Who uh, manufactures uh, CO2? Well, pilots, but we need to have hydrogen. So I'm just uh, telling you this because I'm happy to say that I'm very, very happy to work with the Polytechnic of Milan because uh, yesterday the, we had this news one of the first new uh, research groups of the Polytechnic of Milan and other companies, uh, amongst which ours, uh, well, we will set up a pool of uh, researchers and uh, a research park uh, close uh, to Milan. So thank you, thank you very much. Yes, with Cremona, great, uh, thank you. So thank you very much to all of you who have uh, participated. And also thanks uh, to those who are connected uh, remotely. I apologize to Austria, France, uh, and uh, Germany. Uh, I had not uh, uh, welcomed them initially, uh, but they are so important, Austria, France, and Germany. Uh, it's really something uh, I have to apologize for. Thank you for their presence. We are connected with them and also with colleagues from Romania, Bulgar Bulgaria, Slovenia, Czech Republic, and uh, Poland. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much uh, for your participation to everybody. And um, good luck uh, moving on uh, with uh, our research. Thank you.